you. Um, uh, I'll call the meeting to order, and then can you uh, 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 call roll, please? Yes, Chair Bauer. Here. Um, Vice Chair Shepard is absent. Board Member Bernstein. Here. Board Member Kohler. Here. Board Member McKinnon. Board Member McKinnon. Here. Board Member Pease. Present. Board Member Wimmer. Here. Uh, we have a quorum, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll start the meeting with oral communications. Anyone who wishes to speak on any non-agendized item, we'll have uh, three minutes to make a statement. And in order to do that, raise your hand and Vin will uh, recognize you and um, start the timer. Do we have any people raising their hand, Vin? Uh, Chair Bauer, we do not have any speakers for oral communication. Okay, let's move on to agenda changes, additions, and deletions. Uh, I think there is a one agenda change. Um, uh, great, that's a much, much nicer view for all of us. Uh, this is the last meeting of the 2020 Historic Resources Board, and it's also the last meeting uh, for Roger. And so we want to take this opportunity to recognize Roger's service to the city of Palo Alto. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Roger and I have been friends for, for decades, and I met Roger first in 1979. He wasn't yet on the Historic Resources Board, but he joined it shortly thereafter. He joined in 1994, and I understand that he is the longest serving person on any board or any council in the history of Palo Alto. And that's saying something because Palo Alto was run and when I was a child uh, by a group of people that seem never to leave. Um, I, I, I think it's astounding that any person would offer their time and their expertise for 27 years. And I think the city is better off for it. Roger will be remembered for a number of accomplishments. I think he will end up being the second most prolific architect in, this, in the city's history, only after Joe Eichler, who actually was a builder, but generated more buildings than any other person in the city's history. Roger has his footprint all over the city in, in a wide variety of architectural styles. And he's brought his experience, uh, architectural experience to our board for years. And in fact, encouraged me to join, I hate to say it, years and years ago, it's over a decade now. Anyway, uh, I, I want to recognize and thank you, Roger, for your, um, your unrelenting service. And uh, it's not gonna happen again. We've got new rules in place and we have term limits, um, which uh, uh, I think were carefully vetted and uh, uh, um, put into place by the current, by the last council. At any rate, um, Anyone else who would like to make a comment about Roger's service, uh, be happy to recognize. I can't really see any, uh, oh, Allison, uh, uh, come, Congress. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Bauer. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Mr. Kohler, it is my pleasure to be here today and to congratulate you on your retirement from this board. And thank you for so many years of service. Um, on behalf of our council and all of the other councils you've served and all the people in the community. Um, really, I, I, hope you, I hope you will always reflect on this service um, with, with, um, with pride um, and know that you go with our appreciation and gratitude. Do I talk? Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can. Um, let me see if there, oh, Martin would like to say something. Martin. Yeah. Hi, Roger. It's, uh, uh, as you know, throughout uh, the history of the HRB, there have been some times when um, uh, it's been, uh, emotions get a little higher based on uh, possible restrictions that uh, owners perceive. Um, you would always bring in some pleasant story to actually lighten up the mood. And uh, that's, I think, one of the uh, talents and gifts you've brought to the HRB. So again, thank mm -hmm. you for your service. Great. I, um, 
I'm not seeing any other. Oh, Margaret? Yeah, I'd like to chime in um, and agree with Martin. Your historic uh, stories and little life experiences that you've had that you've shared during our hearings is so charming and endearing. And I've always enjoyed working next to you on the board. And I've also enjoyed being a colleague of yours out in the design world. So congratulations on all the wonderful years. And thank you so much for sharing your expertise. You know, our board was so much stronger because of it. So Roger, please, you know, accept our gratitude. We really appreciate your work. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Margaret. Um, Michael, your hand is up. You're, you're also muted. Yes, uh, Roger, it's been a pleasure working with you and we'll, we'll miss you. It's been a, a great contributions that you've made over the years and we, we're going to miss your, your great experience. Where is he? Great. Thanks. Yep, Thanks, same. Michael. Um, I, yeah. I would like to add that one of the one of the benefits of having Roger on the board um, has been his uh, uh, photography collection. He has photographed, he's an avid photographer. And in the old days when we actually had film, he took pictures of everything. In the digital era, it's, um, he still takes pictures, but it's a little harder to share them with the group, but he would frequently bring in pictures he had gathered together of Palo Alto at a time when it was really blooming in development. And so he, he provided a kind of backdrop for a number of our reviews that just isn't possible for probably anybody but Roger who has, who has taken all these photos. So it's been a, a, a really um, significant contribution you've made, Roger. And um, I hope when we go back to uh, meeting in the, in the council chambers that you will come and, and bring that same wisdom as a, as a citizen to the board again. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I have a few slides to show um, if Thank anyone you. would like to see some field trips we took with the board. Sure. Yeah, sure. Please share. All right. <laughs> Unless uh, there's another member would like to speak. I think all uh, Kristen uh, is the only one who hasn't spoken, and there's no. Um, um, I can't. I can't find my uh, raise my hand here for some reason. But I just uh, wanted to say congratulations, Roger. And my only regret is I won't. You won't be around to help me learn more. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, is anything happening? Shoot. Um, I'm having difficulty sharing my screen. <sighs> Goodness. Okay. Share screen. Yeah. Am I sharing? Not yet. Oh, okay. Ah, there we go. There we go. Okay. Um, let me. Do this. Are we seeing it? Oh, we are. <laughs> okay. Uh, so here, just uh, remember the chambers. <laughs> we used to have meetings there. <laughs> so uh, Roger, Roger, I believe started in 1994 uh, at the HRB. Yes. Yeah. yeah. When we used to have pictures hanging on the wall. And here is just a few memories. Uh, oh yeah, those <laughs> recent memories. We had uh, we had a couple of field trips. They were fun. We went to the Junior Museum and Zoo, and uh, saw the construction there last last December. And the December before, we were at um, uh, Council uh, HRB member Shepherd's home. Wow. And uh, then this is a we we did have a visit to the Girl Scout. I couldn't find that photo. The Girl Scout house. <laughs> we weren't there that long ago. And then um, we had uh, a, a field trip up to San Francisco to celebrate the uh, Rinconada Library that won a CPF award a number of years ago. Hi, uh, Amy. And then, if you uh, Amy, yeah. Uh, if you don't mind me chiming in real quick, at the top of your screen, there's a there's a button that says Display Settings. You oh, want to click on that yes. and click on Swap. Yes. 
Yeah. Oh, shoot. Okay, that's better. Okay. Um, so then here's another photo uh, where uh, we had with when Roger went um, went over to the uh, webinar or a seminar in um, in Oakland with his colleagues here. So that's what I have for uh, our little photograph display. Let's see, I should go back to the other one so you can see it better. <laughs> yeah. Roger, thank you for your service. It's been, a, it's been a great time having you all these years. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. <laughs> thank you, Amy. Uh, I just got, got lost a little bit there, yeah, okay, thank you. How about a round of applause? Good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's uh, deafening here. All right. Um, congratulations, Roger. Once again, you've made history in Palo Alto. <laughs> There'll be more. Thank All you. right. Let's let's move to. Uh, well, I want to. Well, I just want to thank you all for everything that you all have helped us. Coming in and out with stuff to display, and um, check on you. So. <laughs> Okay, we're looking forward to it. Yeah. All right, <clears throat> let's move on to um, next agenda item C, official reports. We're gonna have a um, review of the meeting uh, schedule. This is our first meeting in five months. And um, Amy, do you have uh, any thoughts about future meeting um, schedule? I do. I would like to meet at the end of uh, March next month. Um, I anticipate receiving um, an update from the Office of Historic Preservation as to when our annual um, CLG report is due. Uh, last year it was due in April uh, due, to, due to COVID sheltering conditions. They extended the deadline and I haven't heard a peep um, from them about the deadline this year. So I'm imagining it's also in April, but I'm prepared to, uh, to get that report to you in March. We'll touch upon it today as a study session. And then next next month, we'll uh, have the full report to, to see. Great. So, we'll so March 20th, yeah. March 25th, March. we'll look forward to, the, um, to those materials. So there will not be a meeting on March 11th, is that right? Correct. We really uh, don't have uh, enough projects coming through to have more than one meeting a month. and. Under these conditions, it's been much less than that. Yeah, I totally understand that. Um, all right, the second um, item is uh, a report on um, Black History Month, and we're fortunate today to actually be reviewing a project that has significance for uh, Black history in Palo Alto. Um, yes. Can I say, yeah, we want to say something about that? I'm just going to share, uh, share my screen again, um, and then uh, invite if I don't know if there's any attendees, maybe uh, Ben can have a look. Um, gosh, it takes so long to share this thing. Did, go ahead and say what you're gonna say while I figure out the sharing. <laughs> I don't know, uh, is, Vin, are you there? Is there anyone? Uh... We do have one hand raised, yes. Okay, why don't we um, recognize that while Amy is working to uh, share her screen. Okay, um, in that case, we're gonna need uh, Veronica to share her screen to put up the uh, speaker timer. Oh, and actually okay. it looks like this, actually uh, I apologize, it looks like this person has lowered their hand. So I guess um, they're trying to speak on the next item most likely. All right. Uh, okay. How are you doing, Amy? Just, is it getting anywhere? No, shoot. I did get a new laptop from the city, so I think, um, there might be some setting issues. Okay, let me try this one, application. Okay. Nope. It worked before. Ms. French, um, this is Council Member Cormack. Would it be helpful if I just gave a little council perspective on the this work sure. you're doing while you're doing that? Yes, please. Right. Just fill the time be... here, all right. Um, sure. So I, I don't know, um, it, how much, um, if you haven't met in five months, you might not have had much input from your council liaison last year about the work that we're doing around race and equity and diversity. 
Um, and one of the things that um, we're doing, it's, it's referenced in the report, is we've just completed a 21-day racial equity challenge. It's still available if you're interested in doing it, so about 15 minutes each day. Um, we also had the Human Relations Commission work on the Black and Brown experience, lived experience in, in Palo Alto. If you haven't had a chance to look through that document, it's the second bullet here. Um, I encourage you to do it. There are some stories from people that are tough to read um, and tough to hear about. Um, and when I, um, when I uh, met with um, Ms. French um, in the transition, I asked if there were um, ways that we could connect um, Black History Month and the work that we're doing here. So, um, and of course, the um, current chair of the Human Relations Commission is the pastor of the, of the AME Zion Church, which is now located on Middlefield. Um, so there's a lot of connections there. Um, and I think this is an opportunity for um, the agency to, to take a look at um, how we can all participate. Happy to answer any questions if you have any. Oh, the other thing I should say is that policy and services will be reviewing the diversity, race, and equity work going forward. And that will include work with employees. It will probably also include um, training for commissioners, et cetera. Great. Oh. Looks like Amy hasn't shared yet. So I've got one more um, public service announcement, um, which is uh, Chair Bauer referenced the work we did on boards and commissions last year. And a lot of that work was really around um, figuring out how to have a better experience for all of you. Um, and one of the things we're gonna do is do some training um, for all board members and commissioners um, and, and for chairs and vice chairs. Now, many of you have been you know, serving for so long and I'm, I'm sure you're very comfortable and um, with how we do things, but when we bring um, new commissioners on, it's important that we we help them figure out how to do it. All right, uh, that concludes Great. my public service announcement. Well, it, it doesn't have to, um, but uh, thank you for sharing that. And um, I think Vin, you have uh, put up, um, I'm not sure what this is. You wanna describe it for us? Muted. I sent this to Vin because I was having the difficulty. Uh, this is just a, a, a image I found um, in a past slideshow. I think Emily Vance, who was so good at um, find unearthing some black and white photos. I liked this, and so I put it on for today's meeting. It's a yo-yo demonstration from 1953. Um, anyhow, uh, let's see if I can. Can you forward the screen, Vin? Um, the, and past the Roger uh, items. There we go, this one. Okay, so oh, there we are. AME uh, Zion Church, which is National Register. Uh, we have Paige and Turnbull today, who is serving as the applicant's architect and historic consultant. Um, and we did invite folks from the AME uh, Zion Church, and we're hoping they were able to, to pop in today, but um, it is early in the morning and um, there wasn't a huge role for them, so uh, I understand. Um, if you could, uh, you know, this, this is a cherished treasure in our community. It was rehabbed a few years ago, uh, you know, more than a few years ago as part of a project. Uh, we have the same owner here today to represent. Um, and we have Danielle Condit, who is going to uh, present the next slide. She is a planner that we have uh, brought into the historic preservation program. She's doing a great job um, helping with the, the many projects. You know, during COVID, we've had a lot of property sales still continuing, and people are interested in um, fixing up their older homes. And so we've been quite busy over this past year. Uh, so, um, Ben, if you can forward to the next slide, I'll, um, and then I'll introduce Danielle. Danielle? Um, Hello. Amy, if I can, if I can just um, interject here for a second, we're now on item three in our agenda and under action items. And um, as you have, uh, I, I think I need to read the um, public hearing announcement. Um, so this is uh, a quasi, it's a public hearing quasi judicial um, review of 819 Ramona Street. It's uh, 21 PLN 00015. It's a request from the Historic Resources Board for minor architectural review application for the consistency with the in, uh, Secretary of Interior standards. The project includes installation of a new ridge skylight and four new windows at the rear elevation of the AME Zion Church, which is classified 
as a local historic resource category three and listed on the California Register of Historic Resources and deemed eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. Zoning district is AMF, MUO. Envi environmental assessment is that it's exempt from California in uh, Environmental Quality Act per section 15331, historical resource rehabilitation. So for more information, contact the project planner, Daniel Condit at daniel.condit at cityofpaloalto.org. Now, please be please continue, Danielle, and I apologize for your that for the interruption. No, no worries at all. Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle Condit. I'm an associate planner here with the city of Palo Alto. So happy to be here with everyone today. Uh, the project we brought forward is located at 819 Ramona Street. It is the former location of the University AME Zion Church. Uh, the congregation was located here for 40 years, 40 years before it was relocated to 3549 Middlefield in 1965. Um, as Amy mentioned, we did reach out to um, Reverend Smith from the congregation. A uh, special hello to anyone who may be out watching with us today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we're here today to discuss the proposed improvements. They are located on the rear facade of the existing church outside of the public right away view. Um, we are proposing, or the applicant is proposing to include four new window openings and a low, pri low profile ridge skylight. Um, we do not have a historic planner here on staff, but we are referring to the Historic Resources Board in hopes um, for guidance on the compliance with the SISR. Um, and I will go ahead and refer that, or um, excuse me, <laughs> I will pass the, the presentation on to the project applicant, Paige and Turnbull, um, so they can move forward with the project details. Thank you, Diane. Daniel, um, who's coming? Uh, who's rep I can't see who's representing Paige and Turnbull here in my screen. Hi there. Um, my name is Elisa Skaggs, and uh, I'm with Paige and Turnbull. We're the architect for this project uh, for the um, alterations to the University African uh, Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, the AME Church. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you very much um, and uh, hello to the board. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't see you, so I apologize for not knowing your name. Not, not a problem. Uh, so. Please continue. Okay. Well, um, just to give you again a little bit of background, it sounds like you are pretty are already well versed. But the uh, AME Church was constructed in 1925, and it has been determined to be eligible to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and it is listed in the California Register of Historic Places, and also um, is a contributing building on Palo Alto's historic resource inventory. Um, it has a period of significance of 1925 to 1965, and that is when it was occupied by the uh, African-American Palo Altans in the city. Uh, and this, uh, this photograph, by the way, dates from 1964, and it's the, the front facade of the building. Um, so uh, we uh, reviewed the project and have identified character defining features that really give the, the um, building its unique uh, historic um, uh, value and they include among others, uh, the symmetrical massing of the primary facade, the stone, the stucco cladding, the steeply pitched roof at both the main roof and the bell tower, uh, the triangular um, uh, leaded glass window uh, that's on the front gable. Um, also, the segmented arches, uh, arched openings along the primary facade, the, the bell tower, the open front porch, um, the original and restored leaded glass windows, and the concrete steps to the entry portal. So the goal for this project is to allow more light into the interior space. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the building has some leaded glass uh, windows that are amber in color and uh, don't allow as much light as we would like to have in that space. And so we'd like to bring in more light and make it more attractive for future tenants. And uh, so 
we will do this, we propose to do this by adding a new ridge skylight and also some windows at the back facade. So these are the, uh, the plans um, that show uh, the work. This is the roof plan. Um, on the left, we have the existing plan that shows the portion of the roof that we plan to, um, to demo. That's uh, right in here. We'll have to demo a little bit more to get the waterproofing in uh, of the, uh, of the uh, um, sheathing of the roofing material of the, of the roof. And then on the right um, is a plan uh, showing the skylight. Um, so and this is a, these are uh, elevations of the front facade of the building. Um, on the left is the existing and on the right is the west elevation and it shows what the um, building will look like with the new ridge skylight. And the north elevation and again on the left is the existing and on the right is the uh, proposed new skylight. So we think that this is uh, pretty minimal um, in terms of a uh, interventions. And I think this, this slide um, is uh, pretty informative. It shows a perspective view of the building from the, from the street. On the left um, is the existing condition. And then on the right is the proposed condition. And we've sketched out what the skylight will look like. And again, um, pretty, pretty light touch. Uh, let's go to the windows. So we're proposing four windows along the uh, rear of the facade uh, in this location. This is the existing plan, and then this is the, uh, the proposed plan. And this shows the elevation of the rear facade. This is where we would be removing, uh, making openings for the new windows, um, which uh, we will be uh, uh, seven feet in height and 30 inches in width. Um, four of them, and uh, they will be fixed uh, windows with clear glass. Uh, so we've analyzed these uh, alterations against the Secretary of the Interior Standards, and we believe that we comply with the standards. Uh, the skylight will be only minimally visible, and it will not disrupt the overall form and massing of the building. And it is something that is reversible. So we decide to remove those skylights. We can uh, bring the building back to its original um, condition. And the same thing with the rear windows. Um, they will not be visible at all from the street, so will not impact it in that way. They're also compatible in, uh, with the other windows in size and proportion and materials. They'll be differentiated through their simple design. So uh, someone can recognize that they are not um, part of the building's um, original fabric and therefore will not um, create any sort of false uh, historicism and uh, they will they are reversible. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know whether well let's, I'll, I'll just stop there and if there are any questions we're happy to address them. Yeah I'd like to I'm sure board members have some questions I'd like to ask you a couple of questions just for the record. Um, uh, the skylight on the roof, um, thank you for that comparison of photos. I think the skylight will probably be smaller in impact visually than your uh, drawing. What's the material uh, and what's the color? I'm assuming it'll be some kind of aluminum. It is going to be an aluminum uh, skylight. It's going to be a single prefabricated ridge skylight that's going to be about six feet wide by 10 feet in length. And it will be a dark material um, so that it does not stand out from the, from the, uh, from the color of the roof, uh, a gray. Yeah, so it's uh, probably anodized bronze, which in the photo on the right, both of these photos, you can see the building, the new building beyond the church has a, a bronze colored metal facade. So um, that's, that's probably the color you think? Um, yeah, I think that uh, that um, we probably will, you know, look at mock-ups uh, as we uh, get into construction, just to make sure that that is not something that stands out. We we want to bring light into the building, but we want something that um, it can integrate uh, with both the uh, the form, and that will be through the um, you know the skylight that that follows the the form of the roof, and then also through color. So we'll be looking just to make sure we get a good match for that. 
Sure. On the uh, similar question about the windows are being added on the rear, I note that they're aluminum cladding, which I highly approve of because that encourages and promotes the long-term survival. Uh, what color do you, do you anticipate there? I'm anticipating that we will have um, uh, an anodized bronze color. And again, there we're gonna you know, look at mock-ups and that sort of thing, just to make sure we get a good match, but um, it'll be a, a dark color. We'll try to be compatible with the existing color of the uh, other windows. Yeah, I'm looking at the window colors and that's not bronze, so I'm wondering. Right, it's, it's lighter. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, as we get into construction, we'll take out the, the colors that, uh, it's a Marvin window um, right. that Marvin offers and, uh, you know, have something that's compatible. Okay, and the last question I have is, um, do, do you, I didn't see on the plans the size of the existing windows width and height. Do you know what that is? Um, I am not sure, but we do have um, Steve Lee with us, and he may know the height of the the, the size of the existing windows. Hi, Steve Lee uh, with Paige and Turnbull. Uh, the height uh, is seven feet. Is basically we were trying to match that height and basically match the sill height and the head height. I don't recall off the top of my head what the width of the windows is, but I seem. I'm kind of going from memories. I think it's about four, six, or five feet wide. Yeah, it look, looks to me like it might be four, six, five feet. Uh, right. Would make it almost a square if they're seven feet wide. Okay, I'm, I'm, um, the reason I'm asking the question is um, you've selected narrower windows by, I think, design, and I'm just curious as to why that width was selected. Part of it is just to make sure that we introduce something that does not um, dominate the space. You know, when we when we uh, alter a building, you know, things that we look for are, um, you know, ways to make the, the new feature compatible with the existing, but not dominate uh, or compete with what's already there. So we did want them to be subordinate to the existing we think that matching the height is a good idea, but we thought that by making them narrower, that um, it would um, that it would um, uh, differentiate them, and then also make them subordinate to those wonderful, uh, you know, large amber windows. Sure. Thank you. Just what the answer I was looking for. All right. Uh, any other board members have any comments or questions? Uh, this is Christian. I have a question. Uh, it's. Uh a very unscientific one, but um, I'm just curious, uh, on average, uh, the amount of uh, light being, uh, by these modifications being increased in the space, how would you split that amount between the uh, skylight and the four windows in the back? That's a good question. Um, so the, the windows that we uh, propose to put in um, are gonna have clear glass. And um, you know, the, I mentioned um, we've been there a couple different times, and you absolutely have to have the um, just the the regular light in the space uh, because the natural light that comes in is just not very much. Um, but as far as you know, technical information, how much um, you know light we're going to actually bring in, I don't have that. Um, we can, you know, probably reach out to uh, the manufacturers to, you know, get more information on that, but I, I, I don't have that. Um, but, you know, again, uh, light come from, coming from the top and then um, at the north facade, I think uh, will add um, just a nicer quality and just bring in just that much more um, light into the space just to make it more desirable and, and keep this building in use. One thing that we are pleased about is that um, the building has been kept in just really uh, good condition, and we, you know we want to keep it <clears throat> um, in good condition and also keep it in use. And I think that <clears throat> that adding these windows will add a lot of value to the space. Great, thank you, Martin. You have a question. Yes, uh, thank you, and thank you, Eliza. Um, the uh, the glazing finish of the skylight is that uh, proposed to be clear, frosted, or tinted? It's supposed to be clear. Okay, thanks. Uh, the reason I'm asking that is, 
um, when you look at how the suns would the sunlight would be coming in, um, and if the floor is uh, of a certain age, uh, will there be end up being fading of the uh, interior finishes, particularly the floor, and would that be a concern from any historic preservation uh, concern? Yeah, I don't think that that's going to be an issue, and I don't know whether you have uh, some of the uh, spec information, Steve, to respond to that. Well, in terms of the sun path, we have a very large sky, uh, skylight well, so we don't anticipate that there's going to be much direct sky, um, excuse me, sunlight coming in and uh, directly impacting any of the historic finishes on the inside. And I believe that the, the finishes may have been redone um, in, the pre in the previous renovation. Um, I can't remember if the floor is the historic floor. I believe that has also been um, redone. But in any case, you know, we don't anticipate a whole lot of, we don't anticipate direct sun hitting the floor or any of the finishes due to the large size of the sky, skylight well and also the exposed trusses that will be visible within it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, when it comes time to talk about the Secretary of Interior Standards, I'll have uh, comments and uh, on that when, when you're ready, Chair Bauer. So, okay. Yeah, well, I think we'll, we'll do that in discussion phase. Um, other okay. questions. I, I see another hand up by Jane Vaughn. Um, you're on mute, Jane. I, I'm the uh, property owner and we, uh, oh. I was in charge of doing the renovation. Uh, that floor is all new because what was there when we started uh, the renovation uh, was minimal flooring uh, left, but enough for us to see what it looked like, and so we duplicated it. Great. Welcome, by the way, and thank you for um, preserving this building. Um, any other board members have questions for uh, Elsa? Yes. David, I, I have a quick question. I don't, uh, sorry, I don't see where I can raise my hand. So um, I see that there's a plaque on the front elevation on um, to the left of the stairs. And I was just wondering, there's no detail of what that plaque says. And I'm just wondering if that, if that gives ref reference to the AME Zion Church um, in order to help maintain the history and explain to the public what the original building was. Is that what that plaque is all about? Jane, you want to take that one? Yes. Um, so uh, we uh, worked with the AME Zion Church, uh, largely their historian, Ruth Ann Gray, to come up with the wording that they wanted on there. And uh, I can pull it up. Uh, uh, on the screen if you're interested or just email it over to Danielle and let them know. I think I sent it to you, Elisa, right? Yeah, you did. I may even have it up. I'm not sure. Um, I, I think I have to stop share and then reshare. Um, okay. If, if uh, Are folks interested in taking a look at that? If you want to, um, you could circle back. We can circle back if it takes you some time to find it. Otherwise, we'll wait. Um, uh, let's see, um, Michael, you have any, uh, I can't see you on my screen, but are do you have a, any questions for this phase? Michael, you've got your hand up. Okay. You're muted. So unmute and yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, just have one question, uh, in the report there's mentioned made of when it went to the building department, a T24 submittal. And I have no idea what a T24 submittal is. It's a, it's a um, uh, energy calculation. Um, Amy could probably weigh in on that. Okay. It, it'd be nice if these reports, if, if they reference some of those documents and procedures that there, there's a little explanation given to those of us who are maybe less familiar with uh, the building requirements. It's on page uh, 12. It also T says, title 24 is is what that stands for um and it's so it's part of the building code um yeah i, I just kind of hate the thing of things are thrown out like that assuming that everybody knows what they are and obviously sure. people do not know okay. what they are we'll make sure we um spell it out <laughs> the so I, 
I, I'd like to once again advocate for not printing tree protection um, things in these plans that were presented to boards. That's a gigantic waste of paper. That's part and important for the final submission. I don't know if that's a requirement in the city, but that requirement ought to be changed so we don't waste paper. We all are here not to evaluate whether the trees are protected, but whether this project works um, within our the parameters of our uh, review. And I now see we have the plaque of the um, on the front of the building that's up here. Um, so we could move to that and give people some time to read it. I appreciate that that's there. I think that that really preserves the history of the building to some regard. So I, I really appreciate seeing that. Yeah, so do I. I think these these plaques actually add to the to the history of any city in Palo Alto in this case in particular, in that anybody walking by there can actually understand the significance of the building. I'd, I'd like to see more of these on other buildings where um, they have significance in our history. Thank you, um, Elsa. All right. Um, any, I think we've covered, every board member has um, asked questions. Let's move on to, um, let's close the, uh, actually, wait, I need to ask if there are any people in the public who wish to comment at this phase. Uh, Vin? Chair Bauer, we currently do not have any raised hands. Okay, well, we may come back after we have our discussion. Let's close this open portion and bring it back to the board and have a discussion of the issues that are before us. One is we need to um, determine that the project is in compliance with the Secretary of Interior standards and that um, we recommend to the uh, uh, city council that this be um, uh, considered um, to meet those requirements. Uh, so a uh, discussion by board members. Anyone, Martin, uh, why don't you lead off? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Bauer. And uh, I'm. you can hear me, is that correct? Yep. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'd like to make reference to the uh, requirement for uh, so the uh, Secretary of Interior Standards uh, uh, condition number nine, where it talks about uh, any exterior alterations to be differentiated and compatible in terms of um, uh, the features of those new proposed items. Um, let's see, uh, Amy, are you able to put up my that, the sketch that I uh, presented to you? It's okay. If not, I can hold up the original drawing. It's okay. Um, yes, there. Uh, it, there you go. That's uh, Van helping thank, out. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, when the, Certainly the uh, differentiation is occurring with the windows as proposed. And you can see on the right side of the screen, that's the proposed, uh, uh, window where there are no muttons at all. And on the left, you can see the existing mutton pattern of the historic windows. And uh, so certainly what's being proposed compared to the historic windows, certainly the differentiation occurs. Uh, but where's the compatibility? Um, so uh, my uh, uh, thinking is that if there can be some mutton pattern introduced into the new windows, just so there's some compatibility between the new and the old. Uh, certainly there still be the differentiation, but uh, to have muttons on the old and then zero muttons on the new, I don't see the, the compatibility. Uh, easy to make differentiation, but where's the compatibility? So um, my suggestion, I'd like to hear other board members' comments on this, or perhaps even uh, the applicant also to discuss. Um, uh, the thoughts about uh, getting some compatibility in by adding some mutton bars so that there's some relationship to the old. That's my uh, uh, question for the board members and, and, uh, and the applicant. Um, I, if I can go next, I'd like to continue with Martin's thoughts on the windows. I, I do agree that the new proposed windows seem to be I think that could be more compatible. And my initial thought was to do a pattern of three windows and have them the same size as the existing windows. Because if you look on the side elevations, it seems like there's a pattern of three of these windows, maybe make them the same size as the original windows on the side 
um, have three of them, but maybe I'm not so concerned about the muntins and the, the breakup of the, the window panes, but I feel like if at least they could be the same size and I would suggest maybe three instead of four, I feel like that's another option to gain compatibility. And then if you wanna do the, the muntin pattern, then um, I would support that. But then maybe, I mean, I, I think a simplified muntin pattern, like maybe what Martin is suggest suggesting would be good. But for me, I think it's, the size of the windows, and I think a pattern of three would would look more compatible to me. Uh, okay, this is um, Elsa, I uh, have Elsa, some, hold I on, have... Kristen. I'll get there. Yeah. Elsa, I want to go through all the board members, and then we'll um, at, at, uh, hear from you. So, Kristen, go ahead. Yeah, I, I went and took a look at this. Um, I'm actually comfortable with the design as proposed. Uh, I walked around this building. Uh, in the back, there's really very little visibility to it. Uh, there are air conditioning units and so forth. Uh, I was unable to get into the building. I really hoped I could have done that, but I can understand that it's uh, probably relatively dark in there as it exists now. And uh, I see a good purpose in adding the light. So I'm fine with it the way it is, uh, but I could go either way as well. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kristen. Um, Michael, you're... Um Comments, if you have any. Um, hold on. Michael, uh, well, while we're waiting to see if Michael wants to make comments, um, I have looked at the exterior elevations, obviously, as all of us have, and um, like the fact that there are four windows there. I think that's a differentiation that is um, acceptable to me. I do have the same issue about the divisions. Um, there is a, a, a to, to my view, a stark differentiation between a single light window that size and the all the other windows in the building, at least as represented by the plans, are divided. So I think Martin has a point that it might be um, useful to have some division in these new windows. Doesn't have to be um, extensive or certainly anywhere near as elaborate as the other windows. In fact, it shouldn't be. So I would be inclined to um, uh, see some change to this single light uh, provision. Michael, are you there? I'm here. Michael. You're muted, Michael. Sorry. Good. Comments? On the windows? Yes. Or anything. I think, yeah, I think the, uh, well, I had a, the comment on the skylight. I, I think they uh, they do harken back to kind of an industrial type look. I, I think I've seen that type of skylight on old factories. So I think it's very in keeping with uh, an older building. I wouldn't call it contemporary. So I think it has good, the skylight has good compatibility with that, that building. Any, um, uh, uh, any thoughts on the window compatibility issue? Well, I think uh, there's uh, some, some valid points that have been made. I'm, I'm not a real hard over opinion on, on having a, the compatibility stressed. I think they're, they're very difficult to see from the public view so I think what has been proposed is adequate. Okay. Um, I, th I think the, the, the skylight though, I, I much prefer the look that they have proposed rather than flat panels that would be sticking up because it does have more of a, I would consider like a classical industrial look to it. Yeah, actually I agree with you on that. Okay, Elsa, I'm sorry to have put you in, in, the, in the line last, but share your thoughts with us. Sure, thank you. Let me just go back to sharing my screen here. So um, let me just flip through this. I think uh, I think that what um, the comments have that have been offered um, are valid. I think there's a 
there's a, a way to introduce more muntins in a way that's respectful and still differentiates from the, um, from the existing. And so the existing windows do have that, la that lead caming in them. And if we introduce muntins, they would hearken to the, the, the look of having, um, you know, almost a multi-light uh, window. So we would be open to doing this. And, and here's an option that shows uh, a four over two configuration that would have um, five eighths wood muntins um, on the windows. Um, we do prefer to um, have the height be um, similar to the existing, but we would like to have narrower windows. So if that is something that's acceptable, that would be our preference. Um, so I think that we could um, accommodate them. This, these would um, also um, you know, be differentiated from the existing. So I think that this, would, this option would also um, apply. And that's, that's one thing I like about the standards in that it's not prescriptive um, and it, um, you know, you have to interpret them. And there's, you know, more than one way to, to approach this. I think both are valid. So if um, it would please the board, we'd be willing to um, have an option similar to this one. Martin, is your hand up again? Yes, it is. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. And uh, Eliza, thank you so much for that and uh, for, for preparing your, the drawing on the screen right now, showing the uh, four over two. Um, uh, and then uh, as uh, motions are being entertained, I will be proposing a motion that includes the, uh, uh, the uh, simplified mutton um, uh, specification that you're showing here. Um, going back to uh, uh, board member Wimmer's comment about uh, proposing uh, three windows instead of four, um, looking at the uh, four plan, uh, which is obviously a very symmetrically laid out building, um, which means as you come in the front door, if there were three windows, you would be facing an open window, natural light straight into the building. And uh, as we are photocentric, um, our attention is going to go right to that window rather than the space. And uh, looking back at the history of the building where it was a church, um, usually the uh, online symmetrical straight ahead feature will be some object of art or a pulpit or some object or some furniture or even a painting or an artwork, for example. And so I think having a window dead center, I think will distract from the historical use of the building and even future use of the building uh, for a presentation to come into a relatively dark space with a bright light straight ahead, I think becomes a uh, architecturally visually distracting element. Um, uh, I appreciate Margaret Wimmer's uh, comment about three and three uh, to relate to the outside, but because this is a non-street facing view, I think the exterior view is not going to be a factor on uh, what the building looks like with any alterations are being made. Uh, so therefore, I think the uh, having the four where you're not having a direct source of natural light straight ahead actually serves the interior uh, better for that. So those are my comments uh, based on that. So thank you. Yeah, I was actually, Martin, thinking the same thing that um, in a um, building that has a religious history, potentially could have religious use in the future, having a window right in the middle as you approach, as you enter the building is distracting and is not typical in any, any building that I, a religious building, a building that's used for religious purposes that I've seen. So I'm... Um, Appreciative of Margaret's comments, but I think we ought to stay with the four that are proposed. Yeah, I have one other um, comment. I forgot to ask earlier. Well, one second. Are these fixed windows or are they operable? They're fixed windows. Okay, thank you. Martin? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then as also Eliza mentioned um, about the, uh, the openness of the applicant to have uh, the uh, uh, simplified modern uh, mutton pattern um, again, that from the interior point of view, uh, as people experience the historic windows, then from the inside, they'll see uh, a simplified uh, mutton pattern on the, on the new windows. So again, uh, I, I agree with Mark, uh, Eliza's comment that, yeah, that helps make more compatibility. Thank you. All right. Um, I can't, Kristen uh, or Michael, either one of you want to make a further comment or Margaret? I think Martin's last comment is uh, is a good one. 
and it, it changes my opinion. I, I'm, I, I guess, yes, I, I do appreciate what Martin said. And of course, whenever there's a presentation, obviously the center of that, that center wall would be the primary spot to have a display of something. I just want um, the applicant and the owner, I think, to encourage them to envision the interior because you know we, as we study these applications, we just look at each individual exterior elevation, but in reality, the when you experience the space, you're going to experience it from the interior, and all of these windows are going to be in one space. So I just want the applicant and the owner to envision these windows, the existing windows and the new windows are going to be in the same space. So just um, the, compat the compatibility of the old and the new are going to be visible right in front of you. So I just want to make that point. Great. Michael. Michael. Yes, uh, yeah, I got my hand raised up. Yeah, I think the, uh, the attempts here are, are all valid as far as the overall objective is to make the building suitable for modern living and adaptable and not necessarily to uh, keep it as a museum a church museum. So I applaud the uh, the efforts to add some additional light with the new windows. So I think that's moving in the right direction. It makes the, the, the building really usable in the future, which we're all trying to do that. Great. Thank, thank you, Michael. Um, I, I had one other question for Amy, which um, is a question of record. I don't think that on my term on the board, we've ever had the historic um, resources evaluation done by the same firm that ended up doing the um, architecture. And uh, I think there are some advantages to that, um, but I'm just curious as to whether that ha is, um, has happened before or is uh, unusual. Um, I would say it's unusual. We don't, it's not a normal thing that we do. Um, in the case of this project, it seemed that the, pro that the uh, anyways, the point is we did not hire Page and Turnbull to evaluate their own project. They pr produced a project that they evaluated themselves for Secretary of Interior Standards. Um, if we had a historic planner on staff that had that those qualifications, that would have been a, a perfectly reasonable type of project for a staff historic planner to review and, you know, uh, prepare the, the Secretary of Interior Standards findings. So um, we did not hire another firm to peer review and prepare those findings. So that is something if the HRB um, felt that uh, they were off the mark and um, the HRB was not comfortable uh, weighing in on those findings and the project, um, we could go and hire a, a separate architectural, uh, historic architectural firm to evaluate um, what's been done here to provide that expertise. So, you know, that's something the HRB could decide that they would like uh, the city to do in this case. Well, I'm only bringing, I don't want, I don't want to go down that uh, uh, path. I don't think that's a reasonable uh, expense to ask any, any owner to um, incur, especially since we have extensive experience with Page and Turnbull. We have not always agreed with their evaluations, although I totally agree with this current one. And I um, think Barrett's done a very good job of capturing the history of the building. Who, would uh, or should a project come before the uh, before the board in the future? I'm sure staff would pick this up as a if there were the um, appearance of a conflict, and I don't see one here. Staff would pick that up. Um, but I actually see some advantages in this project of having the same firm that does the resource evaluation also do the proposed um, changes because it, it is, a, um, I think, an advantage to the city and to the owner of the building or the property to have someone who has, you know, complete knowledge of the history in making the changes. So I'm only putting this in the record because I think this is um, a, an opportunity to actually short shorten the um, and, and lower the cost of the review. So that said, um, oh, Jane, you have a um, comment? Uh, yes. yes, it was purely accidental on our part. Um, 
When we did the original restoration, we solely relied on uh, the city's historic uh, preservationist, uh, Dennis Bachlin at the time. And so since he was gone, I thought, well, you know, we should bring in a historic architect because that would facilitate the process. And I had worked with Elisa on uh, a Goodwill uh, building in San Francisco. So when I contacted her, I had no idea that uh, she was filling or her firm was filling Dennis's role. But uh, it was just, you know, someone I was familiar with and knew would be qualified to do this. Sure. Well, and we also have Amy and Danielle um, um, did review it. So it's not as though this project has not been reviewed. Uh, um, and uh, I think that's uh, probably enough said about this. At any rate, um, I want to, and these Zoom meetings are so difficult. I want to circle back and make sure there are no members of the public that would like to comment on this. Um, then if are there any hands raised by anyone? Chair Bauer, we still do not have any hands raised for this item. Okay, it's kind of hard to see because we can only, I'm no, only able to see 12, 12 boxes here on the screen. All right, um, so I apologize for the delay in this. Uh, let's, uh, I would, um, uh, I'm prepared to hear a motion to uh, move this forward. Martin, would you be willing to uh, provide a motion? Yes, thank you, Chair Brower. Um, so I move that the uh, proposed skylight and new windows um, uh, meet the Secretary of Interior standards for renovation and recommend approval of this plan subject to the new proposed windows have a, a simplified mutton pattern for new windows. And, uh, and I would reference the, uh, the drawing that uh, Eliza presented uh, to the board showing the four over two pattern and that the uh, uh, window frames and the skylight frames be the, uh, the darker color. Um, and that would be the extent of my motion. So. Uh, is there a second? I'll second that. Uh, Thank you, Margaret. Is there any additional discussion uh, from board members? Not, uh, Roger, do you wanna, you're, Roger, you're muted. You I'm have to muted. unmute. Oh, muted. now you're okay. Now I'm okay. Yeah, we can hear you. I just wanted to show you, I had this thing had been kicking around and I finally fixed it up, but it's this, can you see there, you can see it? Uh, it's, it's a photo. It looks like a, an aerial photo. Yeah, it's Palo Alto. So oh, yeah. it's hard to tell. Anyway, it'll be in my office. If you ever want to stop by, you can see it. So, <laughs> Good. Anyway, All right. So let's go. Okay. Let's go back to the, the motion. Uh, so we have a, a motion in the second, and I'm not seeing any further... Um, uh, discussion by board members. So that said, Vin, would you, board members? Yes, I'll take a uh, roll call vote. Board member Bernstein? Yes. Chair Bauer? Yes, I support the motion. Board member Kohler? Yes, fine. Board member McKinnon? Board member McKinnon? Yes. Board member Pease? Yes. Board member Wimmer? Yes. Okay, the motion carries 6 0 with one board member absent. Great. Thank you, Vin. Uh, I want to thank all of the participants, the owners, and the, and the Page and Turnbull people, uh, and of course, Amy and Danielle, uh, for all the work. This is harder to do remotely. Um, I think all of us recognize that. And uh, your the Page and Turnbull um, presentation today is, uh, has made it easier for us to evaluate this. So thank you thank for you. Um, all of your contributions and uh, good luck on the project. I look forward to seeing, or in most cases, not seeing 
the changes. So, um, Thank you. Let's move on to okay. study session number four. It's a, it's a, I think we'll have a brief discussion of um, our certified local government annual report. And um, uh, Amy, would you like to lead that off? Yes. I'm gonna try one more time to share my screen, but I do have a backup, my secret weapon, Vin, uh, Vin who I've sent this to. So uh, let, um, me, let, let me just, at this point, while you're loading that up, um, invite Council, Councilwoman Cormack to exit the meeting. This is kind of nitty gritty stuff. You're certainly welcome to stay that you have a life beyond uh, boards. Um, you have that, now you have two jobs. <laughs> Uh, that's kind of you. I'm happy to stay for the whole time. I think um, these details are important, but I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. Sure. Well, just wanted not to feel obligated to stick around. So thanks. We're, we're, we're oh, glad it will be fascinating. Here. So I'm sure. Um, ben uh, is uploading because once again, I've had difficulty. So um, here we are back in the chambers. Important business. Uh, you can forward it to the next then. So um, this is just a quick little uh, report about uh, the, the reporting period uh, that we were going to be reporting on, which is October 2019 through um, September 2020, unless for some reason they extend that period or reduce that period due to COVID. I mean, it feels like a longer year than that, actually. <laughs> but uh, time is funny right now. So um, just to report out quickly, we have uh, we had five meetings within this reporting period. Here are the dates. Um, we did a, a, a few important projects um, listed there with their addresses. Uh, in, and um, we had some upgrades as well uh, to category um, designations in our historic resources inventory, uh, namely the Cardinal Hotel this year. Uh, and 526 Waverly. Both of those projects, uh, those addresses received an upgrade in historic category to the next, uh, next higher level significant resource. Um, and we had a couple of important projects, the, the hotels that came through and Castilea, the, um, which the HRB had done the review of the draft EIR the year before. And this time around, it was the final EIR and changes to that gun historic building and then we had a couple of homes uh, that came through and of course that field trip to the jmz the jmz is um, nearing completion so that's pretty exciting um, then we had our awards uh, that we received through the california preservation foundation uh, i was able to go to that with um, christina dykus and um, john uh, rush and uh, so this was the uh, san francisco awards that uh, was for this document here that council adopted in April of 2018. Uh, these are quite successful as far as use in the individual review process for two-story homes to try to get them to be more compatible with their Eichler uh, neighborhoods. We also got an award for a Dokomomo award um, and that was in New York City, a little too far to travel <laughs> for receipt of that award. Next, Ben. So this is the type of things that we put in our annual review reports. Um, you know, any kind of uh, comprehensive plan, policy implementation. Uh, we have our policy 7.2 that we are actively implementing. Um, any upgrades like the two I mentioned uh, in, in terms of inventory category. Um, and then we have a, a bunch of California Register uh, eligibility um, reports that determined um, and then others that were determined not eligible uh, in our implementation of policy 7.2. We talk about our responsibilities, the number of meetings we had, the training, uh, the board members are obligated to get training during these um, periods. So, and I know some of you have sent on the trainings you attended. It's a, it's a weird year, but in some ways it's easier to attend webinars virtually online. And um, we have that, um, the, we update our GIST system with the, with the new eligibles and not eligibles uh, for each address. 
Um, there's been a number of those. We have the grant that's sitting there waiting for us to submit it. This year we do have a, an estimate from our consultant, um, from one consultant to help us prepare that. Um, if we were to get uh, awarded a grant from CLG. So that deadline is in May, I believe. Um, then we have you know, the, the usual public outreach and education on our program. And um, the Mills Act program establishment, we put a pause on once we lost our historic planner and there hasn't been much work since. Then next. So, you know, here are some questions that we've asked in the past. If uh, the board would like to think about these questions, discuss them, um, that would, uh, we can come back to this slide um, if we want after I present. Um, there's some important questions here. Then next. So, you know, we are a CLG, Certified Local Government, in good standing. That's because every year we submit the, this annual report. And so that qualifies us to submit grant applications. So again, I mentioned we have this mid-century era context statement grant that's been completed, uh, an application, and we now have a, an estimate for that from a consulting firm uh, to submit that grant to the Office of uh, Historic Preservation. Next. Um, I just put up here the HRB roles and duties uh, for those in the viewing public that would like to know what the HRB does. So this is the kind of thing we report out on what our job is as a, as a board. Next. And then um, just quickly, you know, last night at the Planning and Transportation Commission meeting, uh, which I attended, there was a annual report about the comprehensive plan implementation. And so we give these every year to the Planning Commission. And um, that was coupled with the housing element implementation. So I, I, I shared this with you last year. This was our comprehensive plan that was adopted in December 2017. And there's a number of historic policies on here. Uh, notably, the policy L7.2, next, Finn. Um, but there are plenty of other policies here that relate to historic. Next, Vin. So here are the um, critical policies that are actively implemented. Policy L7.2 I mentioned is where we have uh, historic resource evaluations done for the potentially eligible um, addresses that, uh, that were not found uh, in the first round of as national register eligible, but they, you know, some of these still may be California register eligible. And so each time we have a, a property owner that wants to put a, a tear down a home and put up a new two story home, we are uh, doing these evaluations to make sure that it's not California register eligible. So as I noted, we've had a few come back as California register eligible. We also do this, of course, for commercial properties. Um, and then one of those programs is to add to our inventory the properties deemed eligible for the uh, California and National Register. And we haven't uh, done that, um, but we need to discuss a timeline for implementing that policy. Next. Okay, this is just kind of a repeat. Um, I can just quickly go over the comp plan update, uh, then just rapidly go through these next ones so we can get back to that question slide. So these were um, these were some some goals uh, about the historic preservation um, from the comp plan that are future year goals. So there's quite a number of those. Um, we can come back to this later. Next, Vin. And then this was just where we are in the world with the comprehensive plan implementation. So this kind of gives an idea how many actually programs that there are um, found in our comprehensive plan. There's 410 programs that the city is busily trying to <laughs> implement. Uh, next. And um, the report that goes that went to the Planning Commission talks about the priorities, the level of effort, you know, resources needed, and the status. Next. 
And this kind of shows the status of where we are uh, percentage wise and number wise on, on these programs. Many of these are ongoing programs. The bulk of them are ongoing. And then there's some that are pending. Next. Oh, this talks about status by department. I just copied some of the slides from last night. I think there may be one more slide and then I'm done. Um, oh, then there's, you might've heard of the um, housing needs uh, uh, goals that we have, the regional housing needs assessment. And, um, you know, this is, a, this is a tally of what we've accomplished from our last round of uh, the housing element. We were supposed to build 1,988 housing units. And uh, this, is, this is where we are in the world as far as um, accomplishing that goal. You might have heard we're going into the next round of housing element and we've uh, heard from the ABAG uh, what our allocation is. We we're supposed to build something around 6,000 housing units in the next housing cycle. So the housing cycles are about seven years. Um, the, we're, you know, nearing the end of the housing cycle we're in now, but we have a couple more years to accomplish the rest of these. I'm going to stop there. Um, maybe then go back to the, uh, well, we'll just um, ask the chair or the board if there's any slide you would like to hover on um, to have a discussion about uh, goals for the next upcoming or things you would like to note uh, to put into the, the annual report for the CLG. Great, thank you, Amy. That's a lot of information. Um, and I'd, I'd like uh, Vin to this particular um, presentation so we board members and actually anyone else who's watching can review these. There's a lot of information here. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you for, for compiling it. I'd like to make a, a two points. Um, one, I think it's important for Palo Alto community residents to know that a certified local government um, designation is a unique designation to the Historic Resources Board. There is no other board or agency or commission that is a certified local government. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the HRB actually can act in the place of the state of California when uh, applicable. It's a very difficult designation to get. It takes a lot of work, as Amy has demonstrated here, to keep that designation. And it's important that Palo Alto has it. So uh, I, I think that's often missed by um, the bulk of people that I talk to in the community. Second thing, um, back early on, uh, Amy mentioned the Mills Act. Um, the subcommittee that worked on the Mills Act got stymied when Emily left. We are, I'd say, 90% done. And the tough questions at the end of our consideration still need to be answered. I'd like to move that forward and get it to the council. I don't think any Mills Act contract, there's only one Mills Act contract in the city and it doesn't remotely conform to any of the current standards that other Mills Acts um, in the state of California have. I think that we wanna see the Mills Act as a tool for the council to use. And of course, council controls whether it gets used or not. I think we often get sidetracked by the fact that Mills Act is diverting or redirecting property tax revenue, and that scares everybody. Um, and I, I think we just need to get this done so the next time a Mills Act contract comes up for um, renewal, we can actually have a program that serves all of the community and not just the individual property owner. Anyway, uh, Martin, I think you had your hand up earlier. I didn't see other hands, but we'll be willing to recognize them. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Amy, for showing all those slides. In one of your slides, it was, uh, uh, and it's our packet page 66, and it's uh, program number L7.8.1. And I can just uh, read what that is. It's not on the screen right now. 
And, and what it says is... Um, Vin can go back to the few okay, slides sure. too. Okay, thanks. Okay, there you go. There it is. Says, yeah, um, there it is. Okay. yeah, thanks. And where it says uh, uh, promote and expand available incentives and with historic merit in all zones, does the word zones, uh, should that be meaning um, all historic categories? Or is, it, is that the correct word, all zones? And by zones, you mean uh, R, R1, M, you know, the zoning districts? Yes. Or, or should that word be um, all historic categories? That's the question. Uh, I believe this is directly from the comp plan and the word zones is to refer to zoning districts. So residential, commercial, um, yeah, so right now the incentives that we have right. do include uh, residential zones. So it, you might remember several years ago, we updated the zoning code to enable categories one through four to avail themselves on the benefits that were previously only available to category one and two um, homes, I should say. Um, we have not altered the commercial uh, incentives um, for a few decades, but um, but we did that work on the residential zones um, most recently. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the reason I'm asking this up is that on one of the slides you showed previously to this one, it, it actually said draft, and so I didn't know if that's been enacted by the council yet. Okay. Great, thank you, Martin. Any other questions or comments? Oh, oh yeah, my question is, yeah, has, has, has this L7.8.1, that's been adopted by the council? Um, this, yes, this, all of these that I'm showing here were adopted with the, with the, um, comprehensive plan update in December, 2017, which was the council action. Um, so this is an adopted policy, uh, and we have begun implementing this policy, um, most recently with that change of enabling category three and four. Uh, homes basically to take advantage of the, you know, some of the benefits that were incentives that were only available to category one and two homes before. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I want to remind all board members to get to Vin uh, uh, a list of any um, seminars, presumably you've attended online. That's the only way I've done them this year. And I've actually done a lot more um, of these seminars because I had so much time. Uh, but I learned, I just saw one on uh, Tuesday called Guerrilla Historic Resource Evaluation, which was fascinating. And uh, so get that information to Vin so that Amy can put it in our report. Any other uh, board members want to make comments? I know time flies when you're having fun, but there are other lives for other people and the staff needs to move forward with their day too. I, I'm not seeing anything, but I can only see about five of us. So um, let's move forward with the last agenda item. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to, to, to this item in our next meeting or future meeting. Um, approval of minutes, we can do this relatively quickly. Uh, can I have a, a mo any corrections that, or changes to the minutes? Not seeing any, uh, can I um, have a motion to approve? Uh, anyone want to make a motion to approve the minutes? Go ahead. This is Christian, Roger. I make a motion to approve the minutes. Okay. okay. I got a Roger. Roger, Roger you want to you want to second the motion? I second the motion. Yes. Good. All right. Then you want to read the um the poll members? Yes. Board member Bernstein? Yes. Chair Bauer? Yes. Board member Kohler? Yes. Board Member McKinnon? Yes. Board Member Pease? Board Christian, Member Pease? You're, you're muted, Christian. Board Member Pease? Last call for board member Pease.
Um, looks like he just exited the meeting, so I'm guessing he might have had some uh, technical difficulties. All right, well, maybe you could circle back with him. Um, if it's permissible, circle back with him um, uh, directly after the meeting and, and um, just verify his um, vote on this, because he was here when we called for a vote. So I guess you could represent him as abstaining or just, I don't know, not voting, whatever is appropriate. Okay, well, I think we have enough votes to pass even with him abstaining, so um, we can sure. do that. Okay, um, thank you. Board Member Wimmer? Yes. Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, um, last item, board member questions, comments, announcements. Uh, Allison, you have a comment? Yes, Chair Bauer. Um, looking at the plaque that was shown um, on the um, project earlier today, I wondered, is there an interactive map for Palo Alto that allows people to walk, drive, bicycle around and view um, these plaques? Are they, are they somehow documented somewhere in a way that makes it easy for people to visit? I don't know. I don't know if the city has a, a, any kind of map. Palo Alto Stanford Heritage has, um, in normal non-pandemic times, has a uh, um, uh, walks throughout Palo Alto that r recognize and identify historic properties. Um, but I, I you just know, thought I'll I'd ask, show yeah. you what the um, what the Public Art Commission uh, group, Public Art Group has done. There's some temporary murals available right now, and I'm just sharing my screen. You can see like yeah. um, it'll you can you can walk around and you can have this on your phone, and it gives you information on each of the um, artists. For the mural that's there. So I just show this as an example of a way to sort of make these plaques more accessible for people. Um, I just thought I'd share that. Yeah, I actually saw that. That was a really impressive um, uh, piece of information. I, I, I looked at all of them and then walked some of them. So it's a great, it's a yeah. very good yeah. idea. We should do that. We should. All right, let's see. We're down to uh, Kristen's back, um, I see. Maybe. I'm here. Um, oh, okay. Did we were we um, we were uh, taking a roll call vote on the uh, minutes and lost you on on your video feed. Sorry about that. My connection dropped. Uh, uh, I vote affirmatively to adopt the minutes. Okay, good to know. So we're now on the on the uh, board members' um, comments or announcements. And are there any others? I don't see anybody raising their hands. So with that, um, I very much look forward to seeing all of you in the council chambers as soon as is safely possible. But in lieu of the fact we can't do that, it's very nice to see you today after five months of not having seen each other. Thank you for participating and spending the time with us. Um, stay safe and stay healthy. And uh, with that, I'll adjourn the meeting. Bye, all. Bye, everyone. Bye, until Bye. Bye. Bye.